just a couple weeks ago, I believe it was May 13th, was the anniversary, 39 years, I believe it's been, uh, since the MOVE bombing in Philadelphia, when the government of Philadelphia dropped a bomb on the MOVE community. Uh, and to talk more about the, the legacy of, of this action and where we are uh, today in commemorating it, we are very honored to be joined here by Mike Africa Jr., who is the legacy director for the MOVE organization. Mike, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you guys having me. I know you guys got a lot of people on the schedule, and um, I'm honored to be here today. Well, listen, we're happy to have you and no problem making time for you. This is a critically important story in our historical memory. Uh, we cannot forget it. You know, for those who are watching, maybe who have never heard of the MOVE bombing and are maybe like, what, the Philadelphia police dropped a bomb on people in, in, in uh, their own community. Can you say, uh, tell us a little bit, what took place there uh, in May of 1985 when a bomb was dropped on the MOVE community? Well, MOVE is much like a lot of militant organizations. MOVE is like the Black Panther Party, the Nation of Islam. You know, MOVE has a, a reputation for being very aggressive when challenged and against the, the religious beliefs. So the city of Philadelphia had a mayor by the name of uh, Frank Rizzo, who was a very militaristic type uh, poli uh, police commissioner before that, and then even an even more mil militaristic mayor for Philadelphia. And on May 13th, 1985, uh, the city of Philadelphia, or actually in... 1983, the citizens of Philadelphia wanted Rizzo gone. So they elected this uh, very democratic black mayor named Wilson Good. But all of the police, or most of the police, were still Rizzo's police. And the uh, move was a thorn in the side of the city of Philadelphia. And the city's idea of getting rid of this thorn was to drop a bomb. So that's what they did. Uh, and they killed a lot of people in that in that bombing that ignited a fire that, you know, sparked a blaze that took out a community. And, you know, when we talk about obviously that moment in history that hasn't received the attention it deserves or any justice, um, I'm curious, you know, how do you relate it to. I guess the ongoing repression of movements by the security apparatus till this day, because uh, I think that was a bit of a watershed moment in terms of what the country was willing to do. I mean, obviously, the, the U.S. has always been willing to do horrific things to any liberation movements, but to actually bomb a neighborhood, it was unprecedented. Um, what impact did that have in terms of, you know, chilling activism? I think people still haven't really waken up to what's really needed to be done to mm. eliminate things like that from happening. Right now we're watching what's happening in Palestine. We're watching what's happening around the world in, in um, Haiti. We're seeing what's going on in Africa. And these are not things that just started, they're ongoing. I think the news media does a really good job of disarming people with things like protest, but protest peacefully. You know, when um, when Mike Brown was shot in the head, shot, he had bullet holes in the top of his head. When he was killed, the police rose up and they were willing to protect Darren Williams at all costs. They mm -hmm. they uh, they supported him and they gave him whatever he needed. And if anybody tried to hurt a hair on his head, they would have had to deal with the police department. But when it comes to citizens that's been killed the same way, we're told to protest peacefully. We can march, we can protest, but make sure we have a permit. You know, the same rules don't apply for the citizens. You know, they say that this, uh, the police are there to, to serve and protect the community, but that's not the truth. And so I think that um, people haven't waken up to the reality that you can't take advice from your enemy and expect to get anywhere. And all of these politicians that get up there and run for office every four years, that cry and plead for your votes, what do they do? They do what they have to do and they say what they have to say to get elected and then they do what they want to do once they're in that position. So, you know, I think people, um, you know, uh, really need to take a look at what's happening with this genocide Joe character 
that said that he was going to make sure he look out for the African American community and he was going to make sure that he deal with the student loan issue and he he owed the, the people. What did he say? Um, the, the, the crime bill. That's my name is on these bills. And he said that, you know, I, I owe you. I won't forget you. And right now, no, he hasn't forgotten. He's just saying a big F you to the people. So, you know, I think that we need to learn how to do for self and stop waiting for these politicians to give us anything. Obviously, they ain't giving us nothing. No, and I think you, you, you know, I'm glad you made the point about the sort of the propaganda of how they demonize people, the way the mainstream media is distorting things, you know, whether you're talking about Gaza or whatever it may be, uh, Mike Brown, the uprising in Ferguson, because this was the same context with, with MOVE. I mean, you know, this was so much both before and after the attempt to sanitize this by spreading, you know, a huge number of lies and misconceptions to try to get people not to support MOVE. So I was hoping you could talk about that uh, as well. Yeah, you know, MOVE has a very uh, controversial history because of its practices. You know, uh, in 1980, 1970s, dreadlocks were not popular. They're popular now, but back then, I can assure you, they were not. Raw food diet. There's raw, Tabitha Brown is doing her thing. You got raw food restaurants all over the country and outside the country. But if you told somebody that you was eating raw potatoes and raw sweet potatoes in 1980-something, yeah, they looked at you like you were crazy. Uh, a lot of things that MOVE got really demonized for are popular things now. But um, back then, you know, we were, we were called nasty. We were called dirty. Don't, you know, even not, look, we caught discrimination from every angle, from white people, from black people, even our family members that didn't agree with the way that MOVE lived. And, you know, I didn't necessarily, I grew up in MOVE. I was born in MOVE. I was born in a jail cell after a, a, a raid took my parents to prison. So I, you know, I didn't like everything about MOVE either. But I tell you what, uh, I had a whole lot less issues with MOVE than bulldozers uh, knocking our house down and bombs blowing our roof up, right? Um, the demonization is what the city uh, used to, uh, to, to win the opinion of the people so that you know, if, if if the people support what's happening to people, uh, the the issues that's happening, then you know the the news media and the government can get away with what they're doing, and that's why they put out those accusations that move is crazy, so that they can justify it to the people and they can get away with it, and that's exactly what they did. And since then, I mean, what have have there been attempts at? getting justice at holding anyone accountable if so what were those what have those attempts yielded if anything what has it been like to try to get somebody to answer for what was a criminal act right now i'm wearing a hat that says reclaim osage because the city of philadelphia after they bombed our house they took it from our family through eminent domain my my aunt my great aunt louise james africa owned the house outright and the city bombed it, killed her son in the house, killed her brother in the house, and killed all those other move people in the house. They took the house through eminent domain, even though they continued to send her electric bills and water bills, even though they sent her a bill for destroying the house. Uh, and in 1995, she saw, filed a civil suit against the city of Philadelphia for doing what they did. And the city of Philadelphia was on trial, along with the mayor who dropped the bomb, along with the police commissioner who said, let the fire burn, and the fire commissioner who accepted that, that request. The response to that was the, the jury found the city, Wilson Good, the fire commissioner, and the police commissioner guilty. And their punishment was, brace yourself, the punishment was for them to pay a dollar a week for 11 years. That same year, a white oh, woman wow. spilled hot coffee on herself in a, 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 out of a drive-thru at McDonald's. And she won millions of dollars for being burned by coffee. The children that were burned by fire that was burning 2,000 degrees, that was hot enough to melt steel, their families was given the option to take a dollar a week. And then it got worse than that. Hmm. Once the jury made their decision, the judge on the case decided that a dollar a week was too stiff a punishment. So he granted all three of the perpetrators immunity. And then to make matters worse than that, my great aunt Louise James Africa 
when she was trying to get her house back, her dying wish was to get her house back in 2019. Gentrification swept through Philadelphia. And the, the Osage neighborhood was part of that gentrification process. The houses were, were then sold to a developer for $1. I called the developer, told him that I wanted to get the house back for my aunt. He said, we're not giving you the house back because your last name is Africa. Mm. The developer got the house. He sold it for $300,000. The, the home owner then wanted to sell the house to me because he didn't know what the house represented. And now, of course, that homeowner has seen the gentrification wave. So he wants full mm. market value and what he paid for it, which pushed us over $400,000 right. to buy our house back. Wow. Yes. wow. I mean, you've, some of this you don't even really know what to say. Uh, let me ask you this. In terms of, you know, here we are almost 40 years later. You know, I think a lot of people watching this who haven't heard are probably equally feeling shocked. You know, what can they do to support the efforts to, you know, continue not only to commemorate the legacy, but, you know, repair the harms uh, to the extent it can be done uh, uh, in the aftermath? Well, you know, I think that's a really good question, and I appreciate you asking it. We always talk about reparations. That's a very popular topic right now. But what I know about reparations is we've never been given anything. Everything that we've gotten, we've had to fight for it. Black people didn't get chains off of our wrists because we because the white people that kept us in captivity thought it was a good idea when we suggested it. We had to fight for it. We had to work for it. We had to die for it. You know, reparations is something that we're going to have to give ourselves. And so Reclaim Osage is about giving back reparations to us and us doing something despite their resistance to us having our house back. Uh, people can get, get uh, we're, we're asking for donations. We have a GoFundMe. Uh, you can go to my website, www.mikeafricajr.com. The, the uh, website, uh, the GoFundMe is on there, and we're appreciative of every donation that comes in. Well, Mike, I really appreciate you joining us. I mean, this is critically important that we keep talking about this and keep remembering what took place and keep moving forward uh, to, you know, reclaim what can be reclaimed and move forward for a better future. Mike Africa Jr., Legacy Director of the MOVE organization. Thank you for some of your Most time. Most You're on the Freedom Center. Thank side. you.